Hi, I'm Crystal. Um, as she said, I work for the school district in Lancaster. I've been in, educa I've been in education since 1987, and probably in the last, um, I was an elementary teacher. After that, I started coordinating some programs, more academic, and then in the last five years, five, six years, I've kind of like stepped over into this administrative role in working with behavior. And we have, right now, I have a team of nine people that we work closely together and we're trying to work on lots of different supports, we call them tiered supports, in our school district um, across 23 schools. We're working mostly in about 18 of them, a little bit less than that in different capacities. And um, some of the people that report to me are educators, some of the report, people that report to me um, are social workers, licensed, um, mental health social worker clinicians with a license in mental health. And then we also have one that's an LPC, which is a licensed professional um, counselor. So a real married, very group of people that we work with to build these support systems. So just to ask to come here today was um, a real honor to be able to talk with you. I'm, I know he's a board member. I just want to put the context of what you do here at Bridge of Hope. So if you can just give me a little bit of a context of where you are and what you're, what you're working in or if you're a board member or not. So can you go ahead? Yeah, I'm the um, Family and Child Specialist for Lancaster and Chester Counties. Okay. I do the, go into the homes and do parenting and child development and that type of thing. Ah, perfect. So we're gonna, I'm going to learn things from you today. So share your experiences also. Uh, I'm the mentor coordinator from Berks County. Okay. So working with social work skills? I work with the mentors a lot, but I'm actually here, I have two children who are adopted, and so I'm just interested in that on a personal level. And also with some of the moms have had some very severe things happen to their children. Like, sure. Um, yeah. Abuse things. and so neglect. I just, and yes, I wanted to learn more about You're that. smart. Great, great. I'm glad to have you. And your name is Kathy, and you're Kathleen. I'm, well, I go by Kathy. Okay, Kathy, Kathy, I got that. That's easy for <laughs> That's me. Easy, yeah. <laughs> Ah, for little ones too, yes. for the, the nursery school I age. I kids pastures, so I work with a lot of children that have FAS. Okay. Many behavioral problems. Great. And, all right, Jody. Judy. 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 Okay. And Wendy, I know Wendy. And your name, yeah, I know you're Richard. I'm Richard, Richard, where are you from? I'm um, from Bucksmont. I'm a new board member this year. Great. Uh, our sixth child, my wife and I, we adopted. Mm. Uh, he has since he passed away right before mm. he was 30 and we currently have a woman that's homeless living in our home for okay. the start of the second year whose daughter is at the University of Pittsburgh okay and uh, so I've fallen into various relationships that uh, are are familiar to me and some somewhat what we're mm -hmm. talking about and I worked with a homeless Philadelphia for 10 years. Okay. Well, it sounds like all of us are impacted and are impacting this field of from child development the whole way up through adults. And we really know that our work um, spreads the best when we are able to work with the adults because our, that adult learning connects with the students. So a lot of the work that we're doing um, with trauma and poverty at, at the district level, and actually I, I want to bring in some things, of um, some research and real impactful things that are happening across our federal governments too, because the, um, I was just at the White House not long ago and I'm invited with a huge team of people. I went with my superintendent and a representative of different states um, were at the White House to talk about the transition from suspensions and zero tolerance and the trauma that children are having now in their lives. And so politicians, policymakers, the medical field, and some educators all convened and are doing the work of rethinking discipline, which in the last many, many years since the 90s with zero tolerance, we were very um, boxed in about what we did with our policies, which actually came from federal government, came from the state government, came from our school boards, and came from the judicial system. And these boxed policies are just not working. 
for our students and for our families. And I think you're sitting here today and you certainly, you certainly know that. But I wanted to talk about some myths um, first before we get started because I think we, we um, know about myths in um, poverty and then t and many times we, um, sometimes these myths mitigate what we're trying to do. So tell me what are some myths that you know about poverty? Just shout them out. What do you know about poverty that, is a, that most likely is a myth? I think. It's all a consequence of the person's bad choices. Correct. It's their fault, right? They chose this life. What else? Any other myths? Yeah, if they just worked harder by their bootstraps, they'd be way better. And I think that philosophy out in our, you know, in our population mitigates some of the work that you're doing or the work that Bridge of Hope wants to do and the work that schools want to do. It's their fault. I missed, missed that one. I missed that Question one. about what are the myths about poverty? And what was what up? Um, one was, yeah, they don't try hard enough. It's their fault. They don't work hard enough. Um, so uh, as I begin this, I always want to, I start with just saying that the myths that are out there sometimes are not, um, they're not true. Or they're half true. And sometimes they mitigate the work that we have. So let's continue on. I want to tell you two stories, and um, there's a little boy that I've just recently been working on, and I bet you might know this boy. His fake name is Tyrone. He's six years old. He's a terror in first grade, complete terror. He pushes, he hits, he bites, he runs out of the room. Um, at home, he's better behaved, but at home, he has a lot of nightmares at night. Um, he fled with his mother and his siblings from a very abusive father. And the schools are putting, uh, in the past, putting suspension in place for him. And I guess my question is, does it work? And Maria is 15. She's bright. IQ of 139. In school systems, 130 gets you a gifted IEP. But she's failing. She's aggressive. She swears down the hall when she runs from the room. She has no tolerance for respect. She's witnessed significant violence in her life. And let me tell you about the soup story with Maria. This is awesome. She's a very large girl, 15, large, runs out the room. Her counselor has been working with her to do some self-regulation about her emotions when you get this feeling that you're going to explode. And the one question she talks to her a lot about is, you know, she's doing some relaxin, relaxin, relaxation thermometer with her. She's really talking about how she feels right before it happens. And I brought some of these in kid language because I know you're probably working more with the younger students. She talks a lot to her about the cognitive model and how when a situation happens and she has this thought, and she has an emotion, and then she screams and swears and yells. So to, to correct this behavior, let's just come back in to hear about what the situation happens and what is our thought process at that moment. So the counselor said to her, you know, what do you love? What do you love? And she goes, you know, I love soup. And she said, oh, okay. She's like, yeah, she's expecting something different. But she said, well, listen, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to think about soup. I want you to think about your favorite soup. And I want you to pull your hands out and hold that bowl in your hands. And she said, now, she said, I want you to sniff. And so she said, put your face right in that bowl and sniff that soup. So she's, you know, sniffing and she's starting to relax. So the counselor has been trying to work with her on every time you get to this emotional thought before this behavior actually occurs, Think about soup, put your, face in, put your face in the bowl, and do it. So not long after that, Maria runs out of the classroom, effing this, sh pushing, shoving, something happened, and she stops. And people are running down the hall to get her, the, the, student, you know, the resource officer, the administrators, the teacher from the other room, they're all coming out. And she 
if she stops and she goes, she's, she just does this, and all of a sudden she's like, all right, all right, like I know where I have to go, and she walks down, you know, with the administrator. So I tell those stories because that, those are stories, of, that's a story of success. And really it's a story of success because the adult knows. And the adult knows some things and strategies to put in place. So that's what we want to talk about a little bit today, um, continue to talk about. So Dr. Perry, um, out of Child Trauma Academy, and I think you've talked about a bit about trauma in the past, at least there were some trauma sessions here last year, so, but we're gonna talk a little bit about them to connect them to the students today, about the students that you're working with, and the adults. Um, and he, he said that the most developed parts of the brain are the ones that the students are gonna use the most, right? So if you practice this part of your brain the most, it grows the biggest. And this leads into the knowledge that we now have about plasticity. And plasticity is the neurons in our brains. And we know now from research that brains' IQs are not fixed. Brains continue to grow. So the plasticity of this movement of neurons in the brains have really helped us to understand how to behave and react better in the knowledge that we have. So that's a little bit about the brain search. Um, then in 1995 to about 1998-97-98, there was a huge study done in the southern part of California out of uh, CDC Kaiser Permutation, or Permanente, excuse me, and they there's a big, huge, complicated chart. And what they did was they interviewed 17,000 people. And just a side note, in the Southern California where they did this study, it's, um, it was mostly white, middle-class Americans. Not suburban, not as many poverty-stricken people. They were adults, and they did this study about their childhood experiences. So we're gonna take a look at the test that they gave them. They asked them about 10, 13 questions, 10 questions about their childhood experiences. Especially the not okay ones, the adverse childhood experiences. And from this study, this has moved the government to say we're gonna do rethink discipline. This has moved social services to talk more about trauma. This has moved educators to think more about what's happening with our children that are coming in and not well prepared to learn. And it's helped us understand the study of the brain and the brain path of learning. But really, from this study, there's a huge correlation to high risk and early death. Adults that had three or more adverse childhood experiences, who's not okay, had a huge higher risk at death. Um, so they're based on basically three broken bout points. They're based on abuse, physical, sexual. They're based on household, violence, substance abuse, incarceration, living with anyone with a mental health illness. And then they are also um, based on neglect. So it might be an emotional neglect or a physical neglect. So here's what we want to do next. I really like to have us take this quiz that basically asked about this. Because I think, um, it's really asking the question of what your A score is. So when we do this, among a lot of other people, and especially when we're doing this with training with teachers, because we want to raise awareness as much as we want to raise empathy. Um, and I, many times when we have a huge staff of a diverse population that are listening to this, uh, have these experiences themselves. So even when I think about my family and my extended family, I know there are some answers that we can answer yes to this. So it's a very sensitive thing. So what I'm going to do is I just want you to pull, Kathy, can you just pull out a number? Because there's a number on a penny and it makes it a whole lot of, what number do you have? One. Just one. Okay. 
So what we'll do is we're going to answer one, yes to one of them. So you know you're going to have a low score here, but that'll give us. So here's our, here's our quiz. Can you read it? Or should I read it out loud? Probably read it, read it out loud. Okay, before your 18th birthday, did a parent or another adult in your household often or very often swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you? Or act in a way that made you afraid that you might be physically hurt? So let's say no to this one. Mm -hmm. Before your 18th birthday, did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you, or ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured? No. So you'll answer, this is not your answers, right? But you'll answer yes to one of them. Okay? okay? You, you don't have to answer for yourself. Just answer yes to one that was on that penny. Before your 18th birthday, did an adult or a person at least five years older than you ever touch or fondle you or, or have you touch their body in a sexual way or attempt to actually have an oral, anal, or vaginal intercourse with you? I don't even want to pretend to say yes to that, so <laughs> I'll say no. You bet. Before your 18th birthday, did you often or very often feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special. Or your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other, or support each other. Yes. Before your 18th birthday, did you often or very often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes, and had no one to protect you, or your parents were too drunk or high to take care of you or take, care, take you to the doctor if needed? Before your 18th birthday, was a biological parent ever lost to you through divorce, abandonment, or other reason? Before your 18th birthday, was your mother or stepmother often or very often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or had something thrown at her? Or sometimes often or very often kicked, bitten, hit with a fist or hit with something hard or ever repeatedly hit it at least a few minutes or threatened by a knife or gun. Before your 18th birthday, did you live with anyone who has a pro was a problem drinker or alcoholic or used drugs? Before your 18th birthday, was a household member depressed or mentally ill or did a household member attempt suicide? Before your 18th birthday, did a household member go to prison? So I, I wanted you to see these aces, and we picked out that random number of just putting one. Um, the ace test that they're using really far reaching now. They used it as a test to begin with, they used it just to be able to um, start to understand childhood experiences before they were 18 with early death risk factors. So they're now medical doctors asking these types of questions to try to determine if you're at high risk. But when I was at um, when I was at the White House, there's now been continued studies from these experiences. And one that really was shocking to me was they've now taken this and had the study done for children under 18 and thousands of children through Dr. Burke, who is from um, uh, University of Connecticut. And she's now determining these environmental factors, because none of them are about who, like internally in me. These are about environmental factors for children. And they did the same, um, a, a large scale of a large amount of students, and the students that had less than one ace in their life, 3% of them had an academic IEP. So they had some learning problems. This, they had another pile, the students had three or more of these experiences that we just went through. 57% of them 
had an academic IEP. And so we say to ourselves, we're now having learning problems and we're putting supports in place with learning IEPs and that's, um, you know, that's increasing in that number. We're putting them in place for students because of the experiences that they're having and their environmental experiences. And that's real frightening to think about it that way. So. Excuse me, what, what's an IEP? That is a great question, and I saw some nods, but you, that's a wonderful question. An IEP is an... Um, the government comes up with all these, these uh, <laughs> whatever you call them, I, I figured it's mixed up alphabets. It is mixed no up. It's, it is. And I can say there's terms without even thinking that there's a, somebody in the audience that doesn't um, know what those. IEP is an individualized education plan. So it's a student that's severely struggling in either math or reading. Um, it might be anxiety, and they're going to get an academic plan that's through a special education. So if, um, if you think of students that um, or in the, any kind of special education program, those students all have an IEP. Oh, so my, I guess my daughter had one. She has cerebral palsy. She sure did. And, she, and, she finished, and, and they tried to throw her into a school that we went to look at, mm -hmm. and there were children in the hallway screaming and everything. And I said, I'm not putting my daughter Good in this you. environment. Yep. And we went back to the school board, and, and we said, you gotta do something. And they put her in normal class, and they had a they had a tutor, and she went to Bucks County Community College for a term, mm -hmm. and they assigned a student there to sit with her in her class, so they would open the books for her and open mm -hmm. her computer. She was taking a computer thing, yep. so that's what I, I, I didn't know. And those idea. specific <laughs> and those specific plans, having someone with her, having someone open her books, someone wheel her down the hallway, was all in her individualized okay. education plan in her and, academic and the IEP. Saw me once when I was coming to pick her up, and she said, I want to tell you one thing. She said, your daughter understands some of this material more than the kids, in the, the regular kids in the class. <laughs> I'm sure of that. Sorry, I didn't hand these out earlier. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Ask, now please. I was involved with it totally, and I didn't even know it. Yes, you <laughs> certainly were, very intricately. So um, I, want to talk to, I want to talk to you about the brain's information pathway. That just like. Do you know about this? Does this look familiar? Does any of this look familiar? It Not does, but a little I bit. Need a okay, I'm glad to hear that, um, Judy. I've seen this presentation. Um, I, now I do this presentation a lot, but I've seen the presentation so many different times, and every time I see it or do it, I kind of get that a new understanding. And I don't. If it was a larger group, I'd bring you all up here, but I think I'll just I'll, I'll hold them up. Um, I want to tell this is a, the brain's simplified, because I'm not a neurologist, I'm a doctor, but um, I'm going to pull out the parts of the brain that have to do with learning, and it's very, very simplified in terms that I can understand. Um, so I'm going to have a job for you, Richard, when I ask you to ding this bell. Sometimes you're going to ding it really soft and slow, and the next time I'm going to tell you to go at it, go crazy, okay? Just when we're ready, okay? So here's how the brain learns. Always through this typical process. Not always A to B to C to D. Not always exactly this way. Sometimes it's happening at the same time. But these are the things that are happening for everyone to learn. And we know about plasticity that brain continues to learn. Always. It is not fixed. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, even go into the details of, I, I, of the IQ. You know, um, but the brain's always learning, but there's surges in the brain. The brain surge in utero. That's the most Im first important time. So it's surging. There's a lot of growth happening in the brain in utero. And then there's another huge surge when the, the brain is developing and surging and really learning. 18 months old. So in utero, 18 months. The brain just goes crazy again and starts surging and um, growing. Then there's another one. And it's a little bit different from girls to boys. Girls are at 11 years old. Their brains are surging and growing. Boys are around 12 to 12 and a half. 
So when we talk about our school-aged children, that's a really hard time when they're junior high kids. Their brains are the most plastic at that time. And then there's one more time that their brains, brains always growing, but these are these big, huge splurge times. And you'd be surprised when that is. Can you guess? <laughs> Not a bad idea. What do you think? When's the brain one last time that's a big, huge splurge time? I think. It's, it's older than 12. 18. 18. Yeah, it's, it's actually really splurging in the early 20s. So some, I mean, maybe some of the girls are happening more at 18, but that 20, 22-year-old time, the brain is growing again. So when we work with our young moms and our young dads and probably the mo young people that you're working with and through Bridge of Hope, this is a time where this part of the brain, the brain is really, really growing. And they also say it's growing and pruning. So you're pruning along the way all these times, right? You're, you're cutting off things so that other areas grow when you think about a when you think about growing a tree and pruning it in utero, what's pruning it? What's happening at 18 months that's growing it or pruning it? So it's always an interesting fact to think about plasticity, and I think we know a lot of this about the research, brain research. Let me talk about the brain's pathway. So there's stimulus. Stimulus are, they say millions of things are happening in a minute. I hear noise. It's a little, I'm hot, right? You are either hungry or full. There's all this stimuli through all your senses, what you're thinking, all the time. So you get hit with a stimulus. Let's just say for now, for the brain pathway, it's a new learning. So it might be this activity today you're learning about the brain. It might be for a student, a vocabulary word. It might be for an 18-month-old that's learning to navigate walking and hills. It might be learning their name. It might be being able to build blocks, find motor skills. So you have a stimulus, a learning piece. Then it goes through the part of the brain that's called the reticular activating system. And we just call it RAS because it's just easier to say. And you don't have to remember these words, but really the RAS is a filter. And the filter is what you're having to think about. You have to fill, it has to filter somehow. You can't take this million and filter it. You can't do it all. So it filters what's most important for you. If you can filter it by positive thoughts, that's a great way to filter. We'll talk a little bit about that yet when we come through here yet a little bit further. That positive thought, this is where the whole, um, You've heard about the journals, the positive journals, where you write a positive thing out down every day. If you're, if you have a hard time, if you're a negative person, you might need to filter. You're starting to filter your brain by saying, I'm going to give three things that are positive every day. Or this is when you're saying, you know what, I can get out of bed and go to work today. This is when um, the teacher in a classroom connects it to something that they, um, they've done in their personal experiences. They're filtering it through the RAS. These two are kind of, I call them brothers of different mothers. They're kind of connected. Brothers and sisters of different mothers, and here's why. The thalamus is the map. After you filter, it goes through the thalamus, and the thalamus routes it into its place that it needs to go. So you have the learning piece. If it's a math thing that you're learning, it's going to kind of go to that part of the brain. If it's an emotional thing, it's going to go to the emotional part of the brain. If it needs to be in higher thinking, it's going to go to that part of the brain. So the thalamus starts to route it where it needs to go. Very important for learning because you need to put it in the right place. Well, the amygdala is the emotional part. And every single learning that you have, that gets to finally where it needs to be in your brain. Every single thing. So I want you to ding that once. Little emotional tag. 
is great. Tiny, small, emotional tag. This is so important to learn, and we often forget the emotional tag. But let me ask you a question. What did you have last Tuesday for lunch? Chicken salad. Why? <laughs> Why did you have a chicken salad? How do you remember that? Because I was away in, in, at Hilton Head, and when we travel, I take canned things that we can use that won't, won't uh, spoil. spoil. Okay, and Emotional tag, right? Okay, the, what, the, the spoiling? Nope. For the eating. He knew where he was, right? He, had, he, he was somewhere. He always takes that same thing. Has a little emotional tag there. Not only is it just repetitive, that helps also with emotional tags, but it's repetitive and you were away in North Carolina? There had to be an emotional tag there. South Carolina. South Carolina. What did you have? One, two. Corn noodle soup. Well, how do you know it? I made a pot over the weekend and ate it all week long. <laughs> okay, so an emotional tag, it was repetitive, right? But you also made it over the weekend. You were relaxed, you were at home, right? Anybody else not know what they had for lunch last Tuesday? No. Wendy? No idea. No emotional tag to it. And you shouldn't remember it if it didn't have an emotion, if you don't need to. But if it's part of the learning process, if you want your parents that you're working with, these mothers, to be able to learn something, it has to have an emotional tag. But it should be just a small one because we're going to talk about a large one in a minute. After that, after it has an emotional tag and it's routed into the right place, it goes to the hippocampus. And this is back here in the brain. And the hippocampus is the start of the folders, of short-term to long-term memory. So you have to have short-term. And if you can repeat it and repeat it and have good connection to it and continue to learn it and take all the barriers away, it ends up in the cortex. We're going to talk a little bit about the upstairs part of the brain and the downstairs part of the brain, but the upstairs part of the brain is that prefrontal cortex where it controls a lot of our emotional pieces. But if this is the natural pathway for information.